Hello, good afternoon everybody. This is Jessica Crejo with the Iowa Coalition for Integration and Employment and a member of your Employment First team. Welcome to the Iowa Community of Practice for June. We're happy to have you today and we're excited to um, hear from Dr. Sue Ann Morrow. But before we get started, let's take care of a couple housekeeping things. Uh, we are recording today's webinar and we'll be sure to share that along with the materials after the webinar. Um, Sue Ann has a couple of resources or materials to share with you. You can download those directly. She'll be talking about them later as she goes on in her presentation. But if you look to the control panel, that's usually along the right-hand side of your screen. Um, there's a little pod called Handouts. If you click the downward arrow, you'll see those appear there and you can download them directly. But we'll also be sure to share, um, to share them and send them out after as well. If you would like a certificate of attendance uh, for, for participating in today's training, um, I'm happy to get that to you. Please just send the request to me um, or share it here in the comments pod is fine as well. Um, that's also where you share your questions. If you have any questions or comments for Sue Ann as we go along, please um, share those. And I think without further ado, I will hand it over to the lovely um, and most talented Sue Ann. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, I've ne really never used this platform before, but I have uh, talked quite a bit about um, systematic instruction and job coaching, so I'm looking forward to this. I don't know how many of you were, uh-oh, it didn't go. It didn't go. It worked half an hour ago. <laughs> There we go. I don't know how many of you were on the last month's call and Jess was introducing this section and she said, and Sue Ann's going to help us think outside the box. Uh, so now everyone knows how much I worry. So I'm thinking, okay, I got to figure out what I'm going to talk about and I got to find some silly box. So I was a little concerned about how am I going to get all this done. But I hope uh, I talk, I'll talk about systematic instruction and, and fading and okay. Now see, mine's moving. Why won't yours move? So maybe uh, we're going to cover systematic instruction. We're going to cover fading and natural supports. And hopefully I put it in a kind of a different context. Uh, but as Jess and I were talking, systematic instruction is really systematic instruction. Uh, task analysis don't change very much over the years. So um, let's move on. Okay, I want to find out how many people out there were born before 1968? So hopefully you'll see um, the poll here appear or launch on your computer screen. So let us know. Oh, thank you for voting. I'm going to show you what those are. Oh, no, no, no. Just kidding. <laughs> okay. So we've actually got a perfect 50-50 response. 50 mm. yes, 50 no. Oh, really? Thank you, everybody. Okay, thanks, guys. The reason I asked that is because if you if you said no, then systematic instruction is your elder, and you need to be nice to it. Um, systematic instruction is really one of the longest running uh, strategies, if you will to work with uh, individuals, especially with intellectual disabilities. It is considered evidence-based practice to be working with those guys. There is some new research coming out. Uh, it's effectiveness with folks with um, brain injury as well as folks with um, autism. It really, I see it as, it incorporates applied behavioral analysis. It, I see it almost as an outgrowth of uh, applied behavior analysis. When you get into it, you talk. we can talk about antecedents, we can talk about consequences, we'll talk about discriminative stimuli, which I love that word. A lot of people don't love it, but, but there's also other words we can use to make it easier. But being an old uh, humanistic behaviorist, those are I kind of use those words. It also breaks the task. Part of systematic instruction is breaking the task down into teachable steps. And it's important that they be functional, discrete, steps. People sometimes ask, well, how long should a task analysis be? The issue isn't how long it should be. The issue is, is the task broken down into, into teachable steps? And basically, you want one response, which would mean the behavior you want the person to do for that step. You want one response 
for a uh, link in the chain, if you will. hope that makes sense. Um, there was some research way back in the 80s where it looked at a sequence that had 28 responses or 28 steps, if you will. But what the researchers did, they made their task analysis so that one task analysis only had four steps, only had, um, yes, four steps. So that means they, in, they had more than one discrete response in a step of the TA. So the person had to do like uh, four different things to get a plus or to say that they could uh, do that step. The next one had 14 and the next one had 28. And what they found was that the 28, which listed every response necessary to complete that task, was superior to those that grouped the different responses. And I think because we, we talk about you don't want to and, okay, list this and put. You don't want that in a task analysis because once you're trying to determine if they've learned this uh, task you, and, and you're, they're having trouble on that step, you won't know which part of the, that step they're having trouble with, the pick it up or the place part. So that that um, it also task anal or I'm sorry systematic instruction also built has built in a data collection and at the end or toward the end of this we will put this all together and I'll show you what I mean but basically you want to always be monitoring progress um, you want to make sure that the the learner is learning and moving it because if they're not then you want to do something different. There's four components I think we usually consider. One is the cues or the clues, or in Sue Ann's world, the SD, which stands for discriminative stimulus. Then there is the task analysis part, where you, that's what we call when you break the, the task down into the different discrete responses that the person has to do. There's also a system of prompts. Uh, that's really kind of what makes it systematic because once you determine the prompt system or the prompt sequence or the um, uh, the training pr procedure you want to use, you pretty much stick to it. And because it's written, everybody sticks to it. So it's um, everybody follows the same procedure. And that makes for learners who have difficulty learning, that just makes it a lot better, a lot easier. Also built into um, systematic instruction is feedback and reinforcement you're always giving the person feedback of how, of how they're doing, especially in the beginning. Now, we'll talk about fading a little bit later, and so there are some things that you can do that you need to be aware of as you begin to fade um, the, your instruction. But before you ever really think about um, systematic instruction, first look at the task design. You'll see I have an egg timer there. Well, rather than wasting time teaching a person to set the egg timer to like 10 minutes, just make a mark that, where, that he can just see and he can match those. That way you don't deal with that stuff that you don't have to deal with. Concentrate on the things that you can't accommodate or change. Now, anytime you do something like that, you want it to make sure it's individualized, that it's set for that person. You also, it has to be effective and efficient. A lot of the folks that we work with um, aren't very efficient workers. And so you want to make sure that you add nothing to a task that would slow the person down or not get the job done. So just think about that. You don't, don't always have to do systematic instruction prior to you probably you want to see if there's any changes you can make so that you don't waste time. It also has to be non-intrusive, meaning you, you don't want to hang a you know, I wouldn't want that kitchen timer to be like hanging on the wall and this guy has to go over to, to deal with it. I want something that is barely noticeable. It has to fit into the environment is the bottom line. I think you'll look, um, one time I was doing a little bit of a job analysis at a feed store, and this was years ago, and the manager was taking us around and he said, oh, you have to have a master's degree to work here because we have these scales and you have to put in so much um, this chemical or this grain and then the next one you have to put in so much of this grain. He said it's very complex and it's very uh, exact because you don't want to mix the feed up, you know, because uh, cattle eat, eat different feed than horses. So, but as we looked at that, that really, that whole procedure there, that whole process 
of uh, getting that grain right could be a match to sample because it had a little screen up there uh, of what numbers, the digits, it had a, a screen of digits, and when you got to certain digits, that was it. Well, it'd be very easy to say all stock for horses needs these three numbers, these three numbers, and these three numbers. And it could be a very simple match to sample and not have to not have to waste time trying to be so to waste time teaching the different combinations. So anyway, that's always something to think about. Okay. Here may be the, the bonus tip of today. Uh, if you've heard me visit about this, you know this is kind of my thing. The purpose of instruction, I'm just going to read it because it's very important, is not to get the person to do what they're supposed to do, but it's to teach the person to respond appropriately to the naturally occurring stimuli in the environment or the task. How do we know what to do? And that how do we know it's time to go on break? How do we know it's time to get the clothes out of the dishwasher? Or, well, <laughs> number one, you never put the clothes in the dishwasher. But if you did, <laughs> when the bell rang, you'd take them out, I guess. Uh, but how do you know it's time to get the clothes out of the dryer? Well, there's some people have a buzzer. That's what you tell the person. That's what you help the person to attend to. Uh, new learners are not going to know that. They're not going to know that the buzzer means to take it out or the green light's on or um, the bell went off. They're not going to know that or the table's dirty, so that means I need to go wipe it off. New learners will not know that. And if we're not careful, we make ourselves part of the instructional interaction when, when the prompt system we use does not take into account the cue, and this time we're just going to talk about within task, the cue or the clue within the task or the SD that tells you how to respond. Let's, um, I have a short video here that shows uh, how new learners can get very confused when they don't understand all, when they, and then we'll talk about it when, when we're done, see what you think. Okay, so you can see that uh, the Clampets are new learners to Beverly Hills and new learners to having a doorbell. Um, so they're, they're, they don't know that when the music happens, uh, you answer the door. They, they're not attending to the clue or the, or the SD. Someone has to help them learn that. And rest assured that Mrs. Hathaway, or Miss Hathaway did in future episodes of the Clampets. So now they don't have to go around looking for the music. But if you get nothing else out of the day, guys, get that. Because we have to help people attend to what we attend to, that, that we know how to respond. Otherwise, we're going to be we're going to be there forever. Let me give you an amazing example of what not to do. And the, this person, uh, 
obviously is a good job coach, good supervisor. So kind of let me set this up for you. I was in a recycling, um, I don't know what you call it, you know, a barn, recycling barn. So people walk in with their big bags of cans and in the back are about six to eight workers. And so they each have it, there's like two at a table and they're dumping the bags and then they sort cans, you know, pretty typical recycling. Well, over, over, over to the right, there's a guy who is weighing the bags and then marking down how, which distributor they went to, whether it be Pepsi or Coke or beer, however it went. And so the be folks would, somebody from the people who are separating the cans would bring the bags over, give them to him, he'd set them on the scale, he'd make a mark, and then he would take them to their respectful distributor site. Well, the supervisor, this was a new job for him. The supervisor came up and said, Ralph, we need more bags. Let me show you where they are. So he takes Ralph to go get bags. They bring them back and the supervisor puts them wherever they go. I couldn't see that part. But see what happened? That supervisor attended to something. He knew it was time to get new bags or more, more bags, but he did not tell George. He just told George to go get them. Let me show you where they're at. Well, George will never be independent at getting more bags because he doesn't know the SD. The SD was the job coach supervisor. Does that make sense to you? Now, had the, had the job coach supervisor say, George, our bag supply is below this line. That means we need more. Let's go get him. And then he could show him the process. But he put himself right in the middle of that instructional interaction. So George is never going to be independent because he was he was not attending to what the supervisor job coach was attending to. And guys, that happens a lot. It happens a lot. So I'm hoping that uh, if you've been in the Iowa APSI job coach training, that should be another poll question I should have asked. But uh, it we pay a lot of attention to the SDs or the clues within the tab. You just have to, guys. You just have to. So, okay, got that point across. Let's move on. <laughs> oh, let's watch it again. Okay. Another, the other component, remember we talked about clues and cues and SDs are kind of all the same thing. Let's talk about the task analysis. You know, there used to be a whole science to look at, well, science may be too strong a word, guys, <laughs> maybe, uh, a whole process or procedure you would go through to say that your content was valid, that it was effective and efficient. Now we just seem to kind of do it, but I would encourage you, number one, to always watch someone who's skilled at it, uh, see how they do it. You also want to ask the supervisor or the uh, the boss, how it should be done, but okay, here's going to be a wrinkle here though, and we have all seen it, the, the person who does it the most may not do it the way the supervisor thinks it's being done or the way the boss thinks it's being done, but, it's, but the end result is the same. So you have, you have some decisions to make there. Again, it's got to be effective and efficient for that learner but is, are there some steps that need to be incorporated that aren't? Um, are, there, are there ways to make it more efficient? So we just have to, there's a lot that, you know, we think, okay, we'll just go in there, I'll do this task a couple of times and I'll write it down. That's really not very efficient uh, or effective. That will not result in probably a quality task analysis for the learner. So we, we just have, there's a whole bunch to developing a task analysis um, that sometimes I think we overlook. The bottom line is, though, it has to get the job done with the outcome that uh, is desired, and it needs to be individualized. And it, although, you know what, there is a body of literature that suggests a generic task analysis will work, and I think we've probably seen... Um, classrooms do that for maybe like shopping skills or some pre-voke kind of skills. Uh, maybe if they have a, a coffee shop in the, in the school or some kind of store in the school, or maybe even, 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 maybe even in some pre-voke programs, we have like a generic um, bolt sorting uh, TA. 
But even then, guys, that's, that's probably going to have to be tweaked for individual learners. And the last one is it has to result in an act. It has to be right. It has to be accurate. You can't have people making mistakes, especially when they're learning. Oh, let's let's um, um, I have a short clip of Mark Gold. I think, um, in my opinion, Mark Gold forwarded our um, field probably mostly in the area of task analysis. He his prompt system, which is basically called Try Another Way, is pretty much nonverbal and full physical. And that will probably make more sense after we get done. It worked for him. Mark was one of the pioneers, but I think his biggest contribution to our field was the task analysis. Um, there's also, this is kind of a, <laughs> uh, Mark has been dead quite a long time, so this is a very old uh, clip. It's also kind of a marketing clip for uh, when he was alive to sell his system. So, I mean, you can so disregard that. That's not what I want you to pay attention here. I want you to pay attention to his interactions with this learner. Just a couple of things there about Dr. Gold and, and Eugene. You'll notice that he said good as Eugene was working. The reason good is appropriate here, because we all know that we need to tell a person why they're getting that positive, potentially reinforcing statement. The reason it's okay here, because Eugene knows that Dr. Gold is right beside him and paying attention. What happens sometimes in our instructional interactions, we might be across the room and we'll say good. They don't know that we're paying attention. 
And he also didn't use it a lot. He would be the one that would, Gold would be the one that said, no news is good news, as long as they know I'm paying attention. You'll also notice that he did not let Eugene make any mistakes. He'd try another way and then also physically guided him. So it was it's airless learning. He did not make any mistakes. Now, eventually, uh, you'll want to say, and actually, Eugene learned this task very well. That's what I mean when I said uh, Gold probably forwarded our field in terms of the task analysis because by breaking things down into teachable steps, he proved that people who were once thought of unemployable, they weren't even on the radar of, of workers, that they could in fact learn complex tasks. Now Gold would also tell you that being able to put together a bicycle brake is neither here nor there. His dad just happened to own a bicycle store, a bicycle shop, so he had access to bicycle brakes. But the, the, so that's neither here nor there in the real world, but proving that people with significant disabilities, significant cognitive disabilities could learn was a big deal. I'm saying, I, I have to apologize for the language, but that's just the way it was back in the, I'd say he died in 1983. Uh, he was about that age. So I'm saying this is probably like late 70s, early 80s when this was taken. So uh, the uh, other thing to remember is that it had to be accurate if you didn't make a mistake. And here's another thing we always want to be accurate. The decision is in. It's over, not under. Thank you, S. Wheeler, back in 1891, showed us how to correctly load the toilet paper in case any of you were still wondering. You now have a definitive answer. Okay. <laughs> Just thought I'd throw that in there for you. What the third uh, component of uh, systematic instructions, it is, is, um, Systematic prompting. Let me get let me get there. There's several things to think about when we're thinking about prompting. Uh, let's just kind of go through them. Indirect. Now you know originally. Okay, let me let me back up half half a second. Where Mark Gold's prompting was really try another way and physically uh, guiding the person. Later the field came to well we maybe want to use different prompts to give the person less information to see if they could be independent. Remember, our whole goal of our instruction is to help people be, learn how, what we are, we're, we're attending to, but learn to be independent also. So you want to give them a chance to be independent. So the first, if we're, we're looking at the least amount of gold, would call it power, the least amount of information is an indirect prompt. It's a question. It's 11 o'clock, what should you do now? Um, the table's dirty over there, what should you do now? We're not telling them what to do yet. Now, here's a big caveat here. For, for new learners, like the Clampets, if we said, the music's on, what should you do now? They would obviously not have a clue. So this, the indirect prompt is not for new learners. It's, it's once they uh, have demonstrated a little bit of skill. For example, I was with uh, Pauline, um, I think the hotel's even gone now in Kirksville, and we were folding towels, and that Holiday Inn had a specific way to fold towels. Well, if I would have said, Pauline, here's the towel, what do you do now? She would have no clue, because at home they didn't fold it that way. So you can't use that prompt, especially with initial training. The next level, the, the more powerful, is direct verbal. And basically, that you're telling them what to do. It's 11 o'clock, take a break. Uh, the, that table's dirty over there, you need to go wipe it off. Uh, Pauline, if uh, you have the towel on your table in front of you, you need to grab both ends and pull it down. Whatever, whatever the response you want them to do, that's, so you just tell them. You can use the SD, but we'll talk about that more in a half a second, which will make, we'll bring this all together pretty quick. A gesture is giving them even more information. You're just pointing to the dirty table or 11 o'clock or the towel, the, t the top corners of the towel. You just gesture. But again, it's giving more information than just telling them what to do. Modeling, modeling is a great prompt, but you can't use it all that often. I am a real stickler on you don't model a response and then undo it so that they can, so that the learner can do it. 
you really have to have two tasks. So you can, you can do it, and then the person can do it right after you. Probably, you know what, guys, probably the best place for modeling is in the initial instructional interaction. So I could have a towel there and show Pauline how to do my towel, and then she could do her towel, and I could talk her through it, just kind of as, a, as setting the stage for learning. When we were doing a lot of uh, systematic instruction and training, we didn't even put uh, modeling on our prompt sequence uh, radar because you can use it so rarely in terms of instruction. Uh, partial physical, that's where you might touch the person's elbow, uh, touch their hand, just kind of a, a more information that something needs to happen. And then full physical is where you would guide the person through the task, kind of like what Mark was doing. Um, of course, even your prompting system has to be individualized. There's some people that you would not touch, so I wouldn't go with a full physical <laughs> prompt there then. Um, so, but you have those different levels of information to help the person get through the task. Uh, you'll see there at the bottom, it says least to most, 90% of the time. That means for 99% of the task and for 99% of the people, although I have to say that might be a little bit of exaggeration, I'm not for sure about 99%, but for the majority of people, you'll go from the least amount of assistance, the indirect or the direct verbal, onto the most. Uh, that's just pretty much the standard way. Now, sometimes if the task is difficult, you could go most to least. Like you could start out with a physical prompt, get the person going through the motions, and then after so many trials, back off to see if they can do it then more independently. You have those options to you. There's also other couple things, and I forgot to put them on the slide, sorry. There's, um, well, let me talk about that in a minute. Um, let me talk just a little bit about trials um, and practices. Typically, we would teach in distributed, pra distributed practices, meaning that we would just teach as this task came, came along. Like, we would teach a person how to wipe off the table when it became dirty and they were working at the cafeteria. Uh, I would teach Pauline whatever came out of the, the cart with the clean towels, whether it be a towel, a bath mat, a washcloth, or a hand towel. We would just pick one up and we would work on that. So distribute it. It would just whatever, whatever came out. You could also do what's called mast trials, mast as in a bunch. Um, so say Pauline, if this is this is helpful if person has trouble with part of it with a task. Say a guy's a janitor and he really has trouble uh, tying the trash bag or, or shaking the trash bag out to put it in the new uh, the new container. You could do mass trials by going to a place that had hopefully this place of work had a bunch of trash cans and you would practice that step repeatedly mass. You put a whole bunch of trials together. Like with Pauline and I, say she had trouble with the, the bath towels. I would maybe just take out all the bath towels and tr work on that towel as a mass practice. Then I would get the other one. It's just another way to teach if you think someone's having a little bit of difficulty. There's also called spaced trials. And to tell you the truth, I have not used this a lot because it's usually used in a group setting, a, a small group setting, but you could use it uh, depending on, on how, how your interaction is structured or if you had more than one learner. Uh, so you would teach one person and the other person, learner A, would be doing the task. You'd be working with learner A. Learner B would be watching. So then you would be teaching learner B and learner A would be watching. The reason they called that they call it space is because they're not doing it continuously. They're watching somebody else do it. You don't know whether people could learn from watching other people. Um, I haven't seen the literature on it, but it is, it is an option if you're working with a couple of people. Okay, the last part of systematic instruction is the feedback, the reinforcement. The thing that we need to know about feedback and reinforcement, number one, Feedback may not be reinforcement. We have to see the impact it has on uh, the behavior it follows. Second, 
when a person is learning, when it's a new learner learning a new task, you want to provide feedback after every step, every response. Now, you don't want to stay there forever, and so you will uh, not, as they become more competent in this task, you might just provide reinforcement after every fifth. And there's a, there's a, not so much in systematic instruction, however, keep in mind, this comes from applied behavioral analysis. And so in applied behavioral analysis, there is a very sophisticated uh, way to figure out your level of reinforcement. But for us, for now, in terms of instruction, initially, every time they do a step or a response correctly, uh, we want to provide some kind of feedback. Let's see what we got next. Okay, let's kind of put this all together. Uh, you guys are all thinking, oh, sure. Um, this is a task analysis sheet that I used to use, and I like it, and there's a number of reasons I like it. It can get very confusing, but if you have um, been in the Iowa APSI training, you, you, I'm sure you love it too. That should be a poll question. Do you love <laughs> Sue Ann's TA sheet? <laughs> but I, I did take this out of the literature years ago. If you look, I think it's from 1979. A couple of things. You'll notice that it has the SD on the left-hand side of the sheet. And this is in the resources uh, thing, so you can be, take, take it and study it and play around with it. The SD is the clue to tell the person what to do next. And my TAs start at the bottom because this turns into a graph. But if you look at the bottom, um, this is a coffee, making coffee TA. So arrive at work and punch in. Okay, guys, right there, I've got an A and C. That, see, we all have to. That's probably not best, but say I, say I knew that she could punch, once she got to work, she could, it was okay to punch in. That's the SD. That's the cue. That's the clue for Sally to go to the break room because that's where she makes coffee. Now you have to kind of, the, 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 the picture in your mind should now change. She's, no, she's already clocked in, and now she's in the break room. So go, so go back up to, I mean, go to the next SD in the break room. That, that's what you see now. That tells her to get the coffee pot. See how I'm going back and forth? So now, now the picture's changed. Now she's in the break room and has the coffee pot in her hand. Coffee pot in hand. That tells her to place the coffee pot on on the counter. Now, in your mind, the picture's changed again. Now she's in the break room, the coffee pot's on the counter. That tells her to get the, get the coffee from the fridge. Now that seems real complex, but you just work your way all the way up, and that's not a complete coffee-making TA. The beauty of that is, if you have the SD or the Q within the task, you use that for your prompt sequence. For example, let's just say she's a right, okay, okay. <laughs> this gets, it's not get complex, but it's interesting to talk to a phone about it. But, uh, um, remember, we have that prompting sequence, the indirect, the direct, the model, on through full physical. The way you implement that is, let's just say that Sally's made coffee like 10 times, and some of it she has done. Some of it she has down pretty good. When you implement your prompting system, keep in mind, we know what the next step is. Sally doesn't. And some of the learners you learn, you're you working with don't know what the next step is or they wouldn't need you. So you wanna give them three to five seconds. Now you, you may think that's a, a, a long time and sometimes it does seem like a long time because we know what to do next but we have to give the learner time to think. For example, now you're gonna, your audio is not going out here. I'm just gonna kind of demonstrate some of this. Okay, so we're in the break room. So I can add a feedback statement and say, Sally, you're in the break room. What do you do next? Sally, you're in the break room. You need to get the coffee pot. 
Sally, get the coffee pot. And I made gesture to the coffee pot. See, that was five seconds between prompts. I had to give her time to think, well, what am I supposed to do next? So that's why I demonstrated that only because good instruction is fairly slow moving, uh, quiet. It's not a big hoopla. Um, so there's, there's lots of things that go into quality, uh, a quality instructional interaction. The other thing then what I can say is, that's right, Sally, you got the coffee from the fridge. That's correct. That's, that's not only reinforcing that SD, the Q, that's a positive feedback statement. So I added that whole loop there. Now, also, if you'll notice the key down here. Now, this is where some people differentiate, and I'm perfectly fine with whatever, because systematic instruction is hard enough without worrying about data. Remember I said the data uh, collection is already incorporated in it? If you look down there on the left, or on the right, there's a prompt key. Just like I'm sure a lot of you use I for independent, or uh, a plus, or a M for model, or a P for physical, this is the same thing. It's just a different key. Uh, a, if you put a line through the step, that means the person did it independently. If uh, I think that's as far as we'll go with that, because that does get real complex. But I love to talk about it because this forces you to pay attention to that SD, that what you should be helping the person pay attention to. In your resources, there's three other, ta well, there's one task, there's one form, but at three different levels, one at graphs, um, one is just data collected. And the reason I give you those is because they're from Terry Johnson from out in the state of Washington, because she adds some more things. Like she has a time variable. She'll, she'll write down how many time, how long it took the person to do it. She also just records when the person got the step correctly. So she just goes through and puts a plus over the number, which is much easier. But in my mind, you're losing a lot of information. Um, because within that, within your prompt system, you can see whether the person is making small increments from not doing it at all, that step of the TA or that response, to doing it independent. There's a lot of learning that goes on in between. Don't do it, so can do it. And so sometimes if you're working with someone who, who has significant problems learning, you want to see that increment of uh, progress. So those will be at your disposal. Uh, they're the they're very similar. They're just a little different, if you will. Okay, and we can if there's questions about that, we can answer that. Maybe we'll see what we'll see what the questions are. Uh, just there are some general considerations that I think are important um, for as we begin with uh, as we start working with people. Number one, the learner has to know why. They need to know why are we asking them to do this. And I can apply this to all kinds of things, even our own lives. Like Pauline and I at the Holiday Inn, or I think it was the Holiday Inn back then. So we were in the laundry room, but she and I went to the floor with the ladies, um, back then it was ladies, with the ladies who took the towels and stuff and sheets to the rooms because they had to be folded a certain way to fit into the little rack. Well, it was important that Pauline knew that so she would understand the rationale for folding this way. You know, sometimes we ask people to do stuff and they don't have a clue and then we wonder why they don't want to do it well they don't they don't understand why they have to do it that way they don't see the bigger picture uh, so that's important uh, always teach for mastery first then speed I mean that's just you want the person to know how to do it well and then help them speed up um, so make sure they understand how to do it first that that comes first keep your eyes on the task there's no answer in your face. Uh, sometimes you might have heard me tell this story. Uh, when I was a teacher, I actually made a kid a disfluent reader. So when he was a fourth grader, and so we were reading the passage for the week or whatever it was, and when he'd come to a word he didn't know, he'd look at me. And, you know, being the helpful teacher I was, I would help him sound it out and, you know, you know, smile and make sure that he was going to be successful on that word. Well, pretty soon, guys, he was looking at me every nanosecond. Anytime he came to a word, he just didn't have a clue. He was looking at me. He was a disfluent reader at that time. He didn't come in disfluent reader, but I made him one. However, however, I corrected my mistake because then pretty soon I realized this isn't 
this isn't good. So I kept my eyes on the words. I kept my eyes on the task. And pretty soon, again, he began to realize that, oh, uh, Mrs. Morrow wasn't going to be helping him with my facial expressions. And so uh, then he began to look at the words also. But that's that's really hard to do, especially if you're teaching somebody, I don't know how to fold towels, and they look up and they want help. Well, you, you naturally want to kind of look back and tell them they're doing a good job and they can do this, but there's no learning in your face. Uh, the learning is in the task. So when you look at the task, they will look at the task too, guaranteed. Uh, to teach it, you have to know it. You cannot teach something you've never done. Uh, see, I think that's sometimes when we get in trouble, especially with people that need systematic instruction. We're on a job site with somebody. We don't know how to do that job. Uh, we made the decision that they're going to need more than what the employer typically gives. I was in a I was in an office building the other day, and the um, the job coach was asking the worker, "Do you know how to do this?" Well, he was a fairly new learner; he didn't know how to do it. So neither one of them looked very competent, I have to tell you. So to teach it, you got to know how to do it. Uh, train, don't test, because when you train, you do test. And that's really part of systematic instruction. Mark Gold used to say that a lot. As we're monitoring progress and as we're training and people are learning, that in, a, in, a, in a itself is kind of a test because we're monitoring progress. So don't pull something out and test somebody on it. It's a continuous kind of assessment because we're monitoring progress. We're making sure people are learning. Probe data. It's hard to collect data on every trial, so do it once a week. You know, do it every 10 days. Make it fit your schedule, but do it en enough that if, if uh, progress isn't being made, you can step in and do something differently. So we still have to collect data, but maybe not on every trial. Uh, don't become part of the instructional interaction. That's another biggie. Um, just like the, the supervisor job coach at the recycling place, he put himself right in the middle of that instructional interaction. And now he's going to be able to get out of it, but the learner is not going to be as efficient learner had he used the SD or the Q that was within that task. How, how, do, how did he know how to get new bags? Uh, you can't teach from across the room. This, again, is for instruction. Now, when you fade, you might be one against the room. But if you remember Mark Gold, he was right beside that learner. He, and he was paying close attention to that learner. Because here's what happens, guys. The, the guy, the person may make a mistake, then you have to run over and correct it. And that guy just had a trial of making a mistake, which is going to make learning more difficult because he's practiced a mistake. So if you're teaching... Typically, you want to be right beside them, not across from them, not across from them, because then you're asking them to reverse space. But you want to be right beside them so you can help them. So you can, number one, stop if they begin to make an error, so you can touch them to stop the, that response because it's wrong. Uh, and then they also know that you're paying attention if you're right there beside them. Okay, those are the biggies, I think. Um, we have a little bit of time. I don't know if there's any questions up there or not, but uh, fading. Um, you fade from the instructional interaction. That's when you use your prompt sequence. That's when maybe you're going to let the person see if they can do it independently, always first independently. Then if they can't, then you can use your indirect. So you're giving less information to the person. So in essence, you're fading from that instructional interaction. You also can fade from the environment. Now this, you know, this is really pretty hard because say the person's like pretty independent on 90% of the task, but then not quite on the other 10%. So maybe you don't even come to the, the work site until it's that time to do that 10%. Or maybe, maybe you just want to be kind of away. So where do you go? You know, if you go to a break room, you go sit out in the car. It, that's really a, a kind of a situation that you have to figure out what to do because you want to look busy. I mean, you are busy. You're waiting. One time when I was teaching, I was observing a kid uh, from the, from the stage. It was one of those old schools, you know, where the stage and the the gym was below it. And uh, so I was on the stage observing this kid at recess, and the superintendent wanted to know what I was doing. You know, I went in my classroom working. I said, Well, I'm trying to observe this person, little little person that you say has some behavior issues. So. 
There should be two other things on that. It's critical. Uh, fading, number one, you can see data on there. You have to use data to know when to fade. That's that's the one thing. But it also, the way that job was set up from the very first day that developer talked to that potential employer, that's going to have an impact on whether you, how you can fade. If you were, if you were, if that developer, maybe that developer was you, promised that, oh, it'll be done from day one, we'll be here forever, we'll get it done, it's going to be much more difficult to fade. So there's even when we're developing, we have to think about fading from that moment, just because um, it's going to have an impact on how we can get out of there. So that's the big thing about fading, I think. And natural supports, we tend to think of natural supports as teaching supports, but really we want to, there anything, human or technical resources that are available or can be developed in a setting to facilitate a person's integration, and I'd, I'd like to say inclusion or an integration, acceptance and satisfaction, and to promote the goals and interests of everybody in that work setting. And it can take on a lot of different um, there's a lot of diff there's a lot of diversity in um, in natural supports. So let's look at the next slide because it'll it'll kind of give some examples. The one that we usually think of is training supports. Uh, typically, a lot of times it's the job coach that's doing the training, but then it could also be a coworker. Uh, it could be a family member. Jess and I just visited with a mother today who had been a job coach. So uh, that's that's one uh, type of natural support could be organizational supports. It could be that the employer makes accommodations. Maybe the transportation bus doesn't run and so he uh, makes accommodations to the schedule. Or maybe there's flex time built in. So there's those kind of organizational supports or employer supports perhaps. Um, social supports. Um, maybe a coworker asks uh, the new hire or John to have lunch with them or sit at their table. We had a girl, Diana, who was asked to go to a bridal shower with for one of her coworkers. So there's, it doesn't necessarily have to be just training and on the job. It can help this person be included and begin to develop friendships and relationships. Physical supports, to me, that's uh, more like accommodations and maybe a person uses a wheelchair and might need something. Community supports, I don't think we always think about that, but maybe the person rides um, public transportation to get to go to work. Um, maybe maybe they use Uber. Uh, however they get, however other people get to work is things we want to explore. Uh, social services, I think some of the examples there are maybe somebody writes a pass um, to for a vocational goal. Maybe an early, maybe, but they, they, it's more than us. It's outside of us. It, like I say on there, it takes a bit, sometimes it takes a village. And so we want to consider all of these potential natural supports that we hope we can either develop or capitalize on. And then the last one is personal and family supports. Maybe, maybe they're a great advocate or maybe the, the new hire or the support employee becomes part of a self advocacy group which can provide him support uh, for employment as well as inclusion in the, in the community. So I, I tend to look at it a little differently than just on the job, but really helping the person be successful and taking, in other, uh, taking into account other uh, avenues. Uh, so we've covered quite a bit in the last, last 55 minutes. We talked about systematic instruction, and we've talked a little about fading as well as natural supports. I appreciate you listening, and Jess probably has something to add, or I don't know, make something up. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you're going to do. Well, we'll wait a minute to see if anybody has any um, questions, comments. Um, if anybody laughed at my jokes, you could put LOL in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll wait a minute to see if any of those come in. Um, David, did you have any questions or comments you wanted to share? Well, I can add that, you know, systematic, these, these, uh, this content 
is really applicable to lots of people. We should always be thinking about fading. We should always be looking at what's out there to be used naturally. And then if people need systematic instruction, we need to have it in our toolbox so that we can, so that we can assist people. Because if we don't, there's gonna be some learners out there that people say can't work. Sue Ann, I um, got me thinking a little bit on, as you were talking about systemic instruction of the similarities with job analysis and that the more accurate we are in applying some of these principles to the task analysis at the beginning of the job, how that could really be the foundation for how we um, better understand the job but then better understand learning strategies as we break down each of those tasks individually to help the learner learn that job based on the preliminary job analysis could be the foundation for how we build that relationship. It, it just, it, it became a little clear in my mind that there's a very direct connection oh, sure. between those two strategies. Because I don't think you could develop a adequate task or a task analysis as we're using the term here without that overall job analysis to see how it all fits together and see uh, how this supervisor wants it done or done or how much weight you have to be able to lift or how long you got to be on your feet, which all really do have an impact on your task analysis because you may need to make some kind of accommodation. You know, maybe maybe instead of worrying about, I don't know, being on your feet for eight hours a day, see if there's some kind of accommodation like a chair or something that would, it, it, it would have maybe not a direct bearing on the task analysis and instruction, but yet it would because you got to maneuver around there to get in there. So yeah, environment stuff can have a big impact too. Well, I know we talk a, a lot in the menu of services that VR has about the job analysis and the, the job coaching instruction that occurs, but we probably don't, um, we, we're short-sighted in the importance of how those connect and the communication that occurs between both parties to really develop a plan that helps the learner uh, be successful. Mm -hmm. I think the strategies you've outlined we are really important and critical to the process. They can be for some people really need that detailed information. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, just a comment from Eva that um, we Thank always you. enjoy your jokes. Oh. So <laughs> Thank some, you, Eva. <laughs> some positive reinforcement there for you. That would be reinforcement, right? Yeah, because I'll keep telling them. <laughs> <laughs> so we appreciate that. So um, I'll share Sue Ann. She thanks you. And and I'll share her contact information here. If you have any additional questions or comments, sure. or um, even if you, um, you know, Sue Ann shared something today that really got you thinking about something specific that you're working on now, and you want some uh, some feedback and some reinforcement for yourself, you <laughs> just give her a holler, and she'll be happy to process that with you. You bet. Um, like I said, I'll be sure to share the recording after the webinar, along with. Um, Sue Ann's presentation and the additional materials that she shared. Um, don't forget about the Iowa APSI conference coming up. Oh, I don't have my calendar. I think it's uh, it's 15th, it's August, 15th and 16th. Eva, if you're still on there, you probably have it right on the tip of your tongue. Right. Uh, 15th and 16th here in Des Moines at the Holiday Inn Airport. We have a great lineup. Senator Harkin's going to be there. Doug Crandall's going to be there from down south about mental health issues, mental illness. Uh, Rick McAllister is coming back to really look at um, supporting your staff. Uh, I think we have some um, kind of take care of yourself speakers coming. And so it's really going to, it's really turned out to be a very nice um, blend of some local, some Iowa experts, as well as some out of staters. So we can kind of, you know, see what's going on in the rest of the world. So we're very excited about it. And you can take the CESP the morning of the first day Excellent. if people are interested in taking that exam. It's a great conference and everybody wants to come to Iowa. So they do. Really <laughs> and again, that is that is the 15th and 16th. Um, and if you need more information on that, you can email me, you can email Sue Ann, or you can email Eva, okay? Um, or Darren Richardson, our or president. Darren, mm -hmm. you're Richardson, mm -hmm. the president of AFSI. So, um, Look for that or ask for more information if you need it. Uh, we'll be back July 10th after the holiday. We're going to be doing job development strategies in rural areas with Tony Tweed and Rachel Riphagen from 
Hope Haven Rock Valley. Um, and then we'll finish up the year uh, August 14th. Uh, we'll have Catherine Carroll, who's going to be talking to us about discovering uh, the genius of the family and engaging families in the employment process and um, inclusion process. Really excited to have her. Um, so again, July 10th, August 14th, uh, we'll be back. And if you need anything or you need certificate for your participation today, uh, please just give me a shout, give me an email. Um, everybody take care, have a great rest of the week, and we'll see you in July. Bye-bye.